Revelation 9-11. They had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. Bless this word now, Lord. Bless it in Jesus' name. So we have, coming up out of the pit, hell itself. Now, I haven't dealt much with these creatures that come up. You'll find them described in the first few verses of chapter number 9 of Revelation. That's for a future study. But this morning, uh, I'm going to move on from dark matter and antimatter into the... Uh, into what's happening when we connect that with, uh, with what's going on right now. For example, CERN is about uh, opening portals. It's about reaching into uh, another dimension and various terminology they're using. I'll read some of it for you in just a moment. But here's the important part to understand, and I'm going to try to emphasize this from here on out because this is what I see in it. It is the merger of science and religion. Keep that in mind. That's what this is about. And depending on what, uh, what entities involved, what group, what church, whatever, they all have their own agenda, sure. But the bottom line is that it is the merger of science and religion like I have never seen in my few short years on this earth. Now, CERN is... Uh, to attempt the Big Bang in March, it says, and this was uh, uh, written three months ago. And I wanted to give you one more time, I want to read for you the warning from Stephen Hawking. And uh, Stephen Hawking is, is, uh, is of the discipline of called a theoretical physicist. Now, I found out when you get studying this stuff, you've got all kinds of different types of physicists. And, uh, but Hawking is a theoretical physicist, and he, these are his words. This, this, uh, this opening up, this gate, this, this going into uh, the, what's called the Higgs boson to try to find that could destroy the universe. Now, I want you to let that settle in for a moment because uh, this man is speaking strictly from an academic viewpoint and he says that what's happening in CERN, Switzerland could destroy the universe. Now, let me give you this, this disclaimer, and I need to do this constantly with you as we go through this and study this. I am not telling you that I am endorsing anybody that I quote. I am not telling you that I necessarily agree with everything that I give you. What I am trying to do is to lay this out before you for you to consider and think about because there are a lot of possibilities going on here, and we need to be informed. Uh, and informed people are, a, are, are, are uh, armed. Ignorance is very expensive. And my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, he said in the book of Hosea. So uh, I may give you some hypothetical situations that seem wild and unplausible. But I want you to think about these things because some of the stuff that I give you is going to come from some of the most brilliant minds on this earth. So as Stephen Hawking says plainly, that what's going on in CERN could destroy the universe. Well, what is going on in CERN? And I want to read uh, some of the statements that come from these people. And here's what, uh, here's what one says. Sergio Bertolucci, the director of the research and scientific computing at CERN. Here's what he says. The Large Hadron Collider and that's that thing that is 17 miles in circumference, about 300 feet beneath the surface of the earth, the Large Hadron Collider could open a doorway to an extra dimension, and out of this door might come something, or we might send something through it. Now, of course, that begs the question, what do you expect to come out of that door, or what would you send through that door? And the bottom line, he doesn't have a clue because he's in the area that is unknown. And he is, he, he's venturing out into the unknown to try to, and this is why Stephen Hawking is so alarmed, is for the simple reason that he understands, to try to put it in layman's terminology, they're messing with something 
that they cannot control and they may open Pandora's box and when they do it, they won't be able to put this creature back in the box. Now, think about it for a moment. Here is a scientist, a physicist, saying, and he's the head of, the, he's the head of CERN, Bertolucci, saying uh, something could come through that door or we could send something through that door. Now, what door are you talking about? The door, to my understanding, would be at the moment that they have collided these uh, the protons, and I think, I'm not sure if they're using other uh, 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 particles, but uh, we do know they're using protons. And the moment they collide these and uh, continue to, uh, to uh, do scientific analysis of what they're working with, they're trying to reach the point of what's called singularity, the point of singularity is when they have reduced the particle to its, to its I suppose, to its simplest form, to its lowest state, to its, to, to its uh, singularity by the word itself implies uh, to the one element, I suppose. I cannot speak scientifically about this. I speak as a preacher of the Word of God and as a student of the Bible. But the point is that once they reach this point of singularity, they have reached what they consider to be the point of where the Big Bang was initiated, where it started. In other words, the elements that came together to produce everything that you know today. And here's the, here's the thing. They do not know many of these elements that came together to produce what you know today. And there, 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 therein lies the, uh, uh, the mystery and the danger that Stephen Hawking's talking about. Now, I believe in my heart that this physicist is trying to say to you and to me and everyone else who will listen, we are about to embark upon, a, embark upon a pioneer effort. We're moving into the unknown. We do not know what's going to come through this door. Uh, in other words, uh, it may be more going on here than simply uh, uh, what physics can define or describe. There, there may be an element here that doesn't fit our, our uh, standard model. There may be something coming through here that we've never seen before. Uh, for example, a creature. A creature. Something that would uh, come through that. Uh, in other words, maybe an extraterrestrial. <coughs> as, they, as they call them. Maybe that would be coming through there. Whatever, who knows. But the bottom line is, something is going to come through that door... And he's going to send something through that door. Now, we need to keep that in mind because they are opening, as I believe, and I think most of you in here this morning believe, the gates of hell. Now, here's what another uh, physicist has to say about the same thing. And here's what he says. The idea of multiple universes is more than a fantastic invention and deserves to be taken seriously. This is Aurelien Barou, French particle physicist at CERN. Now let me read that again. The idea of multiple universes is more than a fantastic invention and deserves to be taken seriously. That's a big statement. That's the kind of statement you need to, to take home and chew on for a while and meditate about. Now here's James Morgan, BBB, BBC science reporter. CERN's governing council wanted to build a kind of time machine that could open a window to how the universe appeared in the first microseconds of its existence. We might even find evidence of the existence of other dimensions. But to conjure up these conditions, the CERN Council knew it needed to perform an engineering miracle. All right, now that we've read what these scientists have to say, let's introduce to you this morning the Vatican. Now, how many of you all, how many of you know when I say Vatican what I'm talking about? I'm talking about a sovereign government that prints its own money, that sends out its own representatives, just like any other state does in the world. But it is also a church. All right? Now, I don't know of another church on the face of this earth that has that kind of authority. Do you? Do you know of another church that ha that's a sovereign that can print its own money? But the Vatican does. 
Vatican astronomers are searching for alien life, say authors. And this is a quotation from the Ecumenical News, May 15, 2015, if you want to follow up on what I'm giving you. Two evangelical authors are set to release a book which claims that Jesuit astronomers at a Vatican-owned observatory in Arizona are using their telescope and another one called Lucifer to search for extraterrestrial life. The telescope is located on Mount Graham in Arizona. And uh, this is a, a very sacred site to the uh, Indians and Native Americans that live around there. It's one of four sacred mountains, very sacred. Not sacred because, uh, ostensibly, because they bury their dead. It's sacred, they say, because to them it is a gateway. It is a place that opens up to another dimension. And it's strange how that these Indians, these Native Americans, would 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 hold would would believe that would would see it as that, and then and then we have such a dogfight that took place for them to build this observatory on top of Mount Graham. Now, this is what's said about the observatory: that it is the it, it, some have said that it is the most powerful telescope on the face of the Earth, and that it rivals, and some say even surpasses. Uh, Hubble that is in the sky that is that isn't affected by the atmosphere and what have you the, of, the, of the planet So they are they are they are peering deep into space and they're looking for something and now they're saying something is coming and They're preparing for what's coming and it all goes together and presents this scenario for you And I'll read some of this what is even more astonishing the two authors Tom Horn and Chris Putnam say in their book that the Vatican is awaiting an alien savior. The claims in the book called Exo Vaticana, Vaticana, Petrus Romanus, Project Lucifer, and the Vatican's astonishing plan for the arrival of an alien savior are the result of research the two authors conducted at Mount Graham International Observatory. Although Lucifer in the Bible is associated with Satan, the word has its origins in Hebrew akin to light. The researcher also examined Vatican records. Now watch this carefully. While their claims seem too difficult to believe, Horn and Putnam have backed up their research with primary sources. They are, current, they are currently discussing their findings with the media. On April the 1st, they appeared on the show of American Messianic Jew Sid Roth, where Putnam revealed what they had uncovered in the research. Quote, the records in the Vatican go back centuries, said Putnam, who is a theologian. I read two chapters of history concerning the Vatican's interest in extraterrestrials. They have a whole theology developed around what they call the principle of plenitude, meaning anything God could do, He would do. So they consider the existence of aliens the inevitable consequence of God's omnipotence, omnipotence. And on they go. So the bottom line is that the Vatican, whether they had announced it publicly before, is certainly investing a lot of money and effort into finding and communicating with these aliens. <coughs> Ask yourself this question this morning. Now, we've had science fiction movies all of our lives. We grew up with flying saucers and all that stuff. Uh, I've told you time and time and time and time and time again, I do not believe UFOs uh, originate from up there. They originate from here. However real they are, they are demonic. That's what I believe. And I haven't seen anything yet to shake my belief in that. But I do not doubt the existence of UFOs, Bigfoot, uh, the Loch Ness Monster, all these other, uh, they call it cryptozoology. You get into a field of cryptozoology, you get into all kinds of stuff. Blow your mind of what's out there. The lizard man, the moth man up in West Virginia and all this stuff. They belong in the field of what's called cryptozoology. D detection via new telescopes with concave lenses of otherwise invisible terrestrial entities, ITE. It was published by the Thunder Energies Corporation, Florida, USA. Ruggiero Maria Santilli is the man behind this. And here's the citation for the article. I'll read you the abstract. Here's what it says, quote, by using telescopes with concave lenses known as Santilli telescopes, trademark and patent pending by the U.S. public 
publicly traded company Thunder Energies Corporation, we review preceding evidence for the apparent existence of antimatter galaxies, antimatter asteroids, and antimatter cosmic rays. Independently from these astrophysical detections, we present for the first time evidence for the apparent existence of entities in our terrestrial environment that are solely visible via telescopes with concave lenses while being invisible to our eyes and to conventional Galileo telescopes with convex lenses, which entities leave dark images in the background of digital cameras attached to the Santilli telescopes. These entities are here called invisible terrestrial entities of the first kind, ITE-1 or dark ITE. We then present, also for the first time, evidence for the apparent existence in our terrestrial environment of additional entities that are also visible to telescopes via concave lenses while being invisible to our eyes and to conventional telescopes with convex lenses, which entities leave bright images in the background of digital cameras. These additional entities are here called invisible terrestrial entities of the second kind, ITE-2 or bright ITE. It is pointed out that both types of entities entities generally move in the night sky over sensitive areas, and their behavior generally suggests unauthorized surveillance. This paper has been motivated by the significance and diversification of the collected evidence as well as available independent confirmations that warrant systematic inspection of the sky over our sensitive civilian, industrial, and military installations via telescopes with concave lenses so as to detect possible unauthorized surveillance. The dawn of our civilization all, um, all the way to the, 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 the time of this breaking news, we human believed that everything that exists up there is only what we can see with our eyes and with our optical instruments. Well, things have changed now because we have established the existence of entities existing in our terrestrial environment. And these entities are completely invisible to our eyes as well as to our uh, optical instruments, but are fully visible with new instruments, therefore dramatically enlarging our conception of the perceivable universe with um, the far-reaching possibility of future development and discoveries that perhaps are beyond our imagination at this time. The revolutionary Santilli telescope is designed to detect antimatter in deep space. By antimatter, we mean an entity with characteristics that are the exact opposite of ordinary matter, including the index of refraction of light, which is opposite. As you can see in the diagram, we have two telescopes, the Santilli and the Galileo. Now, if you look closely, you'll see that the only real difference between the two is the lens. Notice that the Galileo uses a convex lens, whereas the Santilli telescope uses a concave lens. Now, when ordinary light passes through the uh, Galileo telescope with the convex lens, that lens focuses the light and can be recorded or the image recorded by a digital camera. Should antimatter light pass through the convex lens, it would merely be dispersed along the walls of the telescope and not be focused at all. Now, the exact opposite happens with the Santilli telescope. When antimatter light passes through the concave lens, it is then focused and provides an image that can be recorded by a digital camera. Ordinary light would be dispersed among the walls of the telescope. Galileo originally conceived and constructed his telescope for discovery in deep space. But as we all know, um, Galileo telescope is today used for all sorts of uh, terrestrial view. Our telescope had essentially the same fate because it was originally conceived for the detection of antimatter galaxy way deep into space. However, to our great surprise, we discover that our um, telescope can equally detect entities in our terrestrial environment that are completely invisible to our eyes, to our binoculars, or to Galileo telescope, but they are fully visible in cameras attached to our telescope, for which reason we call them invisible terrestrial entities, 
ITE. We have detected at least two types of ITE. The first type, also called dark ITE, essentially consists of um, entities leaving a dark image in the background of digital cameras attached to our new telescope. And the second type, called bright ITE, essentially consists of entities leaving this time a bright image in the background of a um, of digital camera attached to our telescope, often visible without any enlargement. Our discoveries of in invisible terrestrial entities has been independently verified by um, American astronomers, also according to publications available in the internet. I am a scientist formerly from MIT, Harvard, and other leading institutions around the world. As such, my duty is that of documenting the existence, quote-unquote, of those entities. The question of what those entities are must be answered by our government because those entities appear to conduct unauthorized surveillance of rather sensitive civilian, industrial, and military installations. What we have learned is that reality is much bigger than we originally supposed. Reality consists not only of things that we can see and observe with our eyes and ordinary telescopes, but things that we can't see with our eyes and with ordinary telescopes. He indicated that ITE-1 appeared to be located mostly in the areas of terrestrial or lunar orbits. By contrast, ITE-2 are generally located directly over sensitive civilian, industrial, and military installations and appear to behave in a way strongly suggesting their unauthorized surveillance. They're admitting that they seem to be looking at us or watching us somehow, and I find it interesting that these dark ITEs are mostly found in the atmosphere in lunar orbits, but then these bright ITEs are seen much closer to the surface. And I've pointed this out before, but it's worth mentioning again, Ephesians 6.12, the famous passage about how we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, powers, principalities, so forth. And one of the entities that we fight against is in the Greek, cosmocrators, or ruler of this world. And if you look at the definition that Strong's gave of cosmocrators, it says it's a ruler of this world, that is, of the world as asserting its independence of God, used of the angelic or demonic powers controlling the sublunary world, so the world between the moon and the earth. Very fascinating. And here's another interesting quote. The historical inconsistencies of negative energies have been resolved for antimatter by the underlying new mathematics specifically constructed for antimatter known as isodual mathematics with ensuing novel isoduo theory of antimatter. The above results have been confirmed by a number of independent contributions, which provides a comprehensive list of scientific papers published in referred journals and links to PR web releases in antimatter up to early 2015. As also, the detection of ITE-1 and ITE-2 has been independently verified by colleagues and was disclosed for the first time at an invited lecture delivered at the St. Petersburg Astronomy Club on September 25th, 2015. Just a reminder, September 25th, 2015 was when the Pope was in America announcing the 2030 Sustainable Development Plan. But getting back to the St. Petersburg Astronomy Club here, interestingly enough, the logo has a Saturn symbol to it, and it's considered the oldest and largest astronomical organization in the southeastern United States. And so it's out there. This information is being disseminated. Now, the express.co.uk also published about this article yesterday in an article that they titled The Incredible Pictures Scientists Say Prove Invisible Alien Entities Are Here on Earth. And um, it kind of goes over Santelli and his sort of credibility or lack thereof in the scientific community. But there's a couple interesting quotes from Dr. Santilli in this article. 
one of them being, quote, the question of what those entities are must be answered by our government because these entities appear to be conducting unauthorized surveillance of rather sensitive civil, industrial, and military installations. Now, to those of us who've been looking at UFOs and, you know, the phenomenon for a while, we know that they've hung around nuclear facilities and they've tracked with military pilots and, and aircrafts and things like that. We've, we've known stuff like that for decades. So for him to suggest that it's the duty of the government to figure out is kind of interesting in itself. But in conjunction with this, CNN reported, take a peek into CIA's X-Files. And this was something that's been trending. And the CNN report says, quote, the truth is out there. The CIA has released hundreds of declassified documents detailing investigations into possible alien life. The Central Intelligence Agency posted documents of reported unidentified flying objects that range in date from the late 1940s to the 1950s. While playing off the hype of the TV show reboot The X-Files, the CIA broke down the cases into two categories, whether you side with Agent Mulder or Agent Scully. For believers in alien life and those who want to channel your inner Mulder, one case you can choose to investigate is the case of the Flying Saucer in Germany in 1952. And uh, it goes through all kinds of different cases that have been declassified. So I think what we're seeing here, obviously, is more indication that disclosure is happening slowly but surely. Add to the mix the comments made by Hillary Clinton, whether she becomes president or not. Some people think she will, some say she's not, but regardless, her comments about how she would disclose the UFO phenomenon if she became president is, of course, another one of those empty promises, perhaps. But ultimately, it might all play into this grand deception, this great disclosure that everybody wants to have. Now Sir, the European Center for Nuclear Research in Geneva, Switzerland, is one of the largest scientific centers in the world. The most powerful particle accelerator, the Large Hadron Collider, was built there to find the Higgs boson, an elusive particle that is there to give all known particles their mass. Latest technologies, scientific monster machines, and a journey beyond the physical world known to us are the exciting ingredients of this film. But at the center of this film is the scientist, initiator and sometimes astonished observer in the quest for the unknown. It is not the technology that is important, but the mind that rules. Yeah. I was not, not absolutely sure what I, which way I should go, either more towards physics or maybe to more, towards, more towards mathematics. Well, I was good in physics and I was interested in physics. I was at that time already interested in understanding how things work together. I was always interested in the question, what is the world made of? This is, for example, why I uh, presented the, the speech at the end of the, of the high school uh, on atomos, on atomic physics. Democritus was the first philosopher who had an atomic theory. He said that the human soul should capture the essence of things and thereby attain a cheerful, serene mood. He called it euthemia, the highest good of man. I like to play in, uh, close by to, to small streams. Not exploring nature, just... I think at that time it was just playing. I am a countryside boy. Huh? Mankind's research for the foundations of the world and the origin of matter is the subject of this film, which is dedicated to the people at CERN. Why do we want to find out about things? And what gets some people to dedicate their whole lives to the question what holds the universe together at its core? The goal of this film is to provide a portrait of the modern scientists pioneering a new era at the beginning of the 21st century. The ingredients of a new era are discoveries in atomic physics, political crisis, change and transition, based on the endless curiosity of man on the threshold of further discoveries. We are going to launch out into the deep, folks, and I want you to I want you to follow along with me because the stuff I've been getting into lately is very important. Very, very, very important. And uh, this morning will be no exception. Father, I pray, Lord, for the gift of teaching. I pray, Heavenly Father, for the unction, anointing of the Holy Spirit.
pray that you'd open our hearts to receive the truth. Lord, let us know when we see the truth, and then, Father, when we see it, to embrace it. We pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, now turn to Revelation chapter 13 with me. All right, now turn to Revelation chapter 13 with me. Revelation chapter number 13 and verse number 11. We're going to talk about the false prophet this morning. We have two distinct individuals that show up in 13th chapter of Revelation. One is the false prophet. The other is the Antichrist. And the Antichrist is Satan personified. And uh, in the first part of the chapter there, up until the verse 11, we're talking about the Antichrist. Verse 2, it describes him as a beast that comes up out of the sea. But in verse number 11, the scripture says, And I beheld another beast, another one, coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And then he had power to give life to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast, that should they, and curse that, and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. You'll notice the word worship shows up in here. Now turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, and we believe, uh, we have reason to believe that the books of 1 and 2 Thessalonians were the first books written in the New Testament, written by the Apostle Paul. 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 1, <coughs> We beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto Him. This is the mystery of of the catching away of the saints of God, the body of Christ, that will be here when the Lord Jesus comes back, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us, at that the day of Christ is at hand. Now watch carefully. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. You've witnessed that. You're, you're a witness to it right now. It's an apostasy. It's a falling away from the truth. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. That's the Antichrist. He's the man of sin, the son of perdition. Notice he's, he's spoken of in two different senses here. He's called the man of sin. Then he's called the son of perdition. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now ye know, now watch carefully, and now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And this is what is so important about what I'm talking about this morning, is the two references he made that he says in verse, verse number 5, uh, he said, verse 6 rather, And now you know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. And he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. The word used let here is the old English use of the word, which means to restrain. And so therefore, the power of hell is being restrained until it is uh, unleashed upon the earth. And now exactly when that takes place, that's up to the Almighty, because He's the one who makes that call, not man nor Satan, because He's holding Satan back right now and has been for a long time. As you remember, I talked, I talked to you about CERN. We're going to get back into CERN later, but I just want to make a reference to it this morning. The uh, Hadron Collider, Large Hadron Collider in CERN, Switzerland, it is a particle accelerator, and I'm sure they have other terms for it. The idea is that they're trying to uh, collide particles together to recreate the moment of 
uh, the moment of, uh, I don't like, I don't guess they like to use the word creation, because if you use the word creation, that implies a creator. I believe in the creation, because I believe in the creator. But they're trying to collide these particles together. In doing so, they release uh, particles that, that do not exist in the present form, but they will release these particles when this happens, the, the, the Hadron Collider. And by doing this, they'll be able to examine, look at, uh, experiment with, uh, whatever, uh, these particles that come into existence at the very moment of this collision. And by doing this, they, they believe they're able to go back to the moment of, uh, of the beginning of matter, as we understand it, and learn how all this came to be, or how it came to pass, how it came into being. Now, you and I both know the Bible says in Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created. The, Greek, the Hebrew word for create is bara. It means to bring into existence from nothing. He spoke it into existence. But in any event, in the process of bringing these, colliding these particles together, they've had some strange things happen that they did not expect. And some of these are paranormal. And uh, they, are, uh, they, they belong to the, uh, to the realm of the spirit world. And these things don't fit any of the, uh, they have what's called the standard model. And the standard model, of course, is the way that, uh, that physicists define, declare, examine the known universe by the standard model. But what's happening there, what has happened there at, uh, at CERN, Switzerland, does not fit the standard model. Something's going on that's beyond their control. As I said to you before, and this is quickly passed through this because I've got a lot of material to cover. But what's it, what is happening is that they, are, that they are moving into the realm of the supernatural because they're getting into the realm of antimatter, and it's also called dark matter. And so this collision produces this antimatter, which is also referred to as dark matter, and this antimatter or dark matter has an effect on human beings and animals. It has a, it has a profound effect. And they still are not able to understand exactly what's going on with it or the, or the potential of it or the ramifications of it. And this is why uh, Stephen Hawking warned them that they may be opening up the very gates of hell, to paraphrase, to put it in my terminology. In other words, the destruction of the universe as we know it. And so uh, he's warning them that they are messing with something that is beyond their control. Well, <clears throat> that's the scientific perspective on it. But let's take the biblical perspective on it, and that is that what's going on at CERN, Switzerland may very well be, may very well portend the fulfillment of Bible prophecy, because what it will be doing is bringing the so-called scientific community across this line, this separation of religion and science, this line of religion and science. Your kids are taught that science is the God, is the altar that we worship at, and religion we pay homage. We, we give it lip service. That's, that's the altar they worship at today. Science is the ultimate God. And the Apostle Paul says, watch out for science falsely so called. And as you know, they have Shiva dancing inside a circle given by the Indian government. And Shiva is the God of destruction of the Hindu trinity. Brahma is the God of creation. And Vishnu is the God of preservation. And, and Shiva is dancing inside this circle. And here we are, the highest technology on earth some of the smartest minds on the face of this earth, and they have the god Shiva dancing inside the cosmos and destroying, and from the destruction comes a new creation. It falls into the hands of Brahma. And so the point is that, that, the, point is that the Hadron Collider is destroying, it's, it's bringing uh, this huge, that this, it's bringing together these particles, and you have this destruction that's taking place, but from the destruction you are creating because you are allowing men to look into something that they couldn't see any other way. So that's the idea. That's the, that's the overview of what's going on. It gets a lot deeper than that. But let's talk this morning about Mount Graham, which is in the state of Arizona. Mount Graham is, uh, is, uh, is, is controlled essentially by the Arizona State University and the government and, uh, and a few other uh, entities, I suppose. Mount Graham is an observatory. And it is, a, it is a remarkable observatory because of, the, because of the circumstances surrounding of how it came into being. 
The Apaches are still with us. You may not know that, but they still are. And uh, along with a lot of other tribes scattered throughout the country on reservations and what have you. And Mount Graham is one of the, was one of the four holy mountains, four holy uh, sacred mountains to the Apache. And you say, well, why? Well, that's a good question. Why? Why is it sacred? It is sacred to them because to the Apache, it is a stargate. It is a, it is a, it is, it's like you remember the back of the Old Testament when Jacob uh, at his ladder, what did he say when he saw that ladder? What was, what was going on there at Jacob's ladder? Uh, ascending and descending from where? Into heaven. Uh, you might refer to that as a stargate. A stargate is a place where you can move from this dimension into another dimension. You can move from this place into another place. And uh, uh, for example, in the book of Revelation, the apostle John said, I saw a door open in heaven, right? And the door that was open in heaven, of course, carried him up into the future. He was in the spirit on the Lord's day, it says in the beginning of Revelation. And when he, when he reports what's in Revelation, he's reporting what he saw. I saw these things. And he therefore was a, a, first, a first-hand witness. So uh, there's many other cases of this. And this is, I'm jumping a little bit. This will be on down the road. But stargates have to do, therefore, with the, with the movement from this dimension into another dimension. And uh, the Apache Indian now, since they have uh, since they built this observatory on top of Mount Graham, at the bottom of this mountain, they have their cameras and they have been videoing all of these phenomena that's taking place up here, UFOs and all this stuff that's happening around this stargate. Now, folks, I want to tell you something right now, give you a caveat, a disclaimer, before we move further into this. And that is that I'm going to present to this material to you this morning in a hypothetical situation. I may not necessarily agree with everything I'm saying, but I'm giving this information out to you for the sake of information. And then we'll take it and compare it. Uh, I believe in debate. I firmly believe in debate. I believe that a school system, a university, or any uh, school system like that, that has only one view on anything, uh, they're blind. I believe in debate. I believe that you should be able to defend your position. I, I'm, uh, if you are a born-again believer in here this morning, you have nothing to fear from science. You have nothing to fear from anyone. And uh, if, you're, if you're born again, you believe the Bible. I believe the Bible. I believe the Bible is the absolute authority. I believe it's the inspired Word of God. And I don't believe you're ever going to dig up anything or see anything or experience anything that's going to disprove this book. So uh, the idea is that, uh, that uh, you know, we, uh, we're smarter than you. Uh, uh, you're a little peon. Uh, we're going to condescend to your level and patronize you. And we're going to teach you. We're going to tell you what's best for you. We're going to tell you what's good for you. That's exactly the position of the government today and academia. And that's what's happening. So in any event, the Apache Indian is at the bottom of Mount Graham. And he's up here videoing all this stuff. And he's watching what's going on. Now let me read an article for you about Graham. Then we'll move along. Yeah, this was from WorldNet uh, WND. What is it? WorldNet, uh, what's the D stand for? I don't remember. But anyway, what daily? World, what? Daily. daily. WorldNet Daily. It's one of the most powerful and advanced telescopes in the world. It uses the fierce power of Lucifer. Now put that in the back of your mind. To capture images of planets outside our solar system, peer back toward the beginning of time. The Large Binocular Telescope, or LBT, perched atop the Mount Graham International Observatory in southeastern Arizona, contains an immensely powerful tool that allows humans to observe the faintest and most distant objects in the heavens. Now put this in the back of your mind right now. They are looking very, very intensely off into the heavens. And they're looking for something. They're expecting something. The Vatican is connected directly with what's going on on the top of Mount Graham. The Vatican has uh, Jesuit astronomers that are connected with what's going on. They're watching very carefully for what's going on on the top of Mount Graham. Now let me go jump ahead a little bit because I know I'm going to run out of time before I get into the love material I want to cover with you this morning. Tom Horn, who is an investigator, uh, you might call him, he'd be, he'd be like an investigative reporter. Tom Horn 
on doing a little treatise on Mount Graham, says that Horn said he spoke with a Jesuit at the Vatican Observatory who told him astronomers there are searching for extraterrestrial intelligence and planets inside our solar systems. Now let me drop this with you for just a moment. I read just a few days ago an article about an about a NASA, a scientist with NASA, female NASA scientist, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. We're talking now. She said, quote, there is no question that there are extraterrestrial beings out there and that we will come in contact with them. No doubt. They're there and we're going to come into contact with them. The Vatican has pushed itself to the forefront in the observing, the observation of what's up there that's coming down here. In other words, the Vatican is saying something's up there and it's coming down here and we're going to be here to receive it when it gets here. We're going to be the first ones to, to acknowledge its presence and we're, and because, of course, we're the church. The rest of you are just peripheral peons. The church is headquartered in Rome, Italy. We're the church, you see. And the rest of you, uh, if you ever do make it to heaven, you'll make it to heaven through our church. Therefore, if there are extraterrestrials, they'll understand fully and completely right off the bat, we are the top dog, the chief dog of the boneyard. That's the idea of the Vatican. Now, do you believe that? No, I don't believe it, but they believe it. That's what's important about this. They're looking for these things to appear, and they say they're on their way, and it's just a matter of time before they make the announcement that they're here. Now, don't you start thinking with me this morning. How could they be so certain that something is coming from up there to down here and that they're going to be the ones that, they, that the extraterrestrials acknowledge to be the, to be the supreme uh, representation of religion on this earth? And there's going to be a connection. This is important. This will connect religion and science. If you remember, under Charles Darwin in the 1800s, Religion went one way and science went the other. And a lot of people bowed down at the altar of Darwinism over the Word of God. And then, of course, a whole new thing was created from it. It's called theistic evolution. And that is that you believe in God, but you believe He used evolution as the, as the way to bring about uh, uh, the uh, life as we know it. So we have this... We have this we have these extraterrestrials, these ETs, that are on their way to this earth. And the Vatican has built one of the most, one of the most high-tech observatories in the world on top of Mount Graham to observe their coming. And located right over next to them is this seven-story edifice that's called Lucifer. Now, you and I both know Lucifer, as I've told you before, is a Latin word. It shows up in Isaiah 7. Uh, Isaiah chapter, what is it, 14? And uh, 14 something. Lucifer shows up one time in the whole Bible. It's a Latin word, not a Hebrew word, but it is connected with the devil. Anybody that's a Bible believer has no problem connecting Lucifer and the devil. You ask anybody, uh, who is Lucifer? Oh, that's another word for the devil. But not with these people. But anyway, that's another thing altogether. So uh, they are coming down. Now, here's a statement by these astronomers, and here, according to Horn. In fact, they told us that nobody in academia now any longer believes that humans are the only intelligent life on a planet in this galaxy. Nobody. None. Zero. They said that all academia now accepts the fact that it's really just a matter of time having to do with us locating life on other planets and not just organisms, but intelligent life. And maybe intelligent life literally trillions of years ahead of us in terms of their evolution. Horn added, It feels like they even know something or they suspect something or they're simply putting themselves in a position in case extraterrestrial life is discovered to be the go-to religious source. Beyond Lucifer, 
That was really the deeper reason that we went to Mount Graham. And of course they are. Now, I want you to listen to me this morning, what I'm talking about, because it's important. How many of you understand the green revolution that's going on right now? Agenda 21. Now, this is we're going to spend a lot of time with Agenda 21, but Agenda 21 is not of the United States, but it exercises authority over the United States. And Agenda 21 is connected with the Green Revolution, and it moves into the very sovereignty of the states and the sovereignty of personal ownership. Agenda 21 is an all-encompassing thing that is moving right into this country and all over the world. It's connected with the Green Revolution. The Green Revolution is connected with Gaia. What's Gaia? Gaia is the earth. And the earth is supposed to have a spirit about itself. It has a life. It is a living entity. And therefore, we humans are destroying the earth. Therefore, we are immoral. And because we are destroying this earth, we are immoral. We need somebody to come along and straighten us up. And that's what Agenda 21 is about. You see, this is the hypothesis, the hypothesis of it. I don't believe that, but this is what they're teaching. And Barack Obama is pushing what? What's he been pushing a lot here lately? What? Green energy and and the global warming agenda and the uh, and the uh, sustainability the whole nine yards. This is why the Keystone Pipeline out there from Canada on down in the United States. He was so uh, he he was so against it is because it's supposed to it's possibly could, could pollute the earth you know bust the pipe bust so forth and so on all this. But the bottom line is that. Uh, the President of the United States right now is, 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 is fully in the Green Movement. Remember this now. The Green Movement is part of a one-world government attempt to bring you under the, all, the whole the, uh, the, the umbrella of this coming extraterrestrials from above that planted man on this earth. And, he, and these things up here put man on this earth. It's called transpermia. They put man on this earth, and when they put man on this earth, they've been observing us on this earth, watching us evolve, and now they're going to come back because they're mad because of what we've done to the earth. And so they're going to come back, and they've got a message for us, and they're going to do something about the earth. They're coming as saviors. You say, well, now, preacher, where are they coming from? They're nothing up there, folks. It's all demonic. But I'm, what I'm trying to do is to give you how these people think, how they're thinking. And this is where we're leading to. Pope Francis is the present Pope. He's the present Pope. And he is uh, in the process now of coming to America. He's going to, uh, he's going to give out an encyclical. This encyclical has to do with, uh, with the Green Agenda, Agenda 21, uh, with Gaia, the Earth. Uh, the, this Pope, as you might, as you should, as you know, is a Jesuit priest. And he is the first and only Jesuit priest, the only one that has ever been the Pope. And uh, he is, uh, as you could, if you followed him at all, you can see where he has said some things that has angered a lot of Catholics. And I'll say this right now for you this morning. There's a lot, an awful lot, of conservative Catholics out there that have no use for Pope Francis. Okay? They got no use for him. As a matter of fact, you can read their blogs, go to their websites, and you'll be amazed at the criticism coming from these Catholics about their Pope. Now, of course, you know, that's not good. They don't, they're not supposed to do that. Uh, when he speaks ex cathedra, he speaks from the, cathed from the seat, the cathedra from the seat uh, with the authority of God, but they don't accept him. They've rejected Pope Francis. He is a Jesuit priest. He is a Marxist. He's a Leninist. He's a socialist. He is definitely coming against what America stands for. He's not about what we're about. But he is definitely in the forefront of this movement to do what we're talking about. How many's ever heard of astrotheology? Astrotheology. The Catholic Church is in the forefront of the alien connection Savior. The idea that the aliens are going to come down and they're going to save us. Now keep this in mind. You say, well now preacher, I don't believe that. Well, it doesn't matter whether we believe it or not. You're going to be informed. You're going to be able, when, when you get done this morning, you should be able to put a lot of stuff together and makes more sense to you. In the book of Daniel, chapter number 11, verse number 38, it talks about this, this, this person who shows up. Daniel eleven thirty-eight. 38. The 
Daniel 11, 38. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces. The he, of course, is referring back to the Antichrist. And it says he will honor the God of forces. This is a strange alien God. That's exactly what it's talking about here in Daniel chapter number 11. An alien God, a strange God, that he intends to honor. Malachi Martin, how many's ever heard of him? He's a Jesuit priest, Malachi Martin. Now let me give you this warning. I'm telling you this stuff as it is presented. And it doesn't mean that I necessarily agree with everything that's said, but I want, to get you, I want you to get a broad perspective of this so we can put a lot of this stuff together later. Malachi Martin said that Satan is enthroned in the Vatican. That's what he said. Malachi Martin said that the Jesuits are trying their dead level best to take control of the Vatican. And when they take control of the Vatican, they intend to make it the leader in the one world government to bring about a one world government and a one world religion and the Jesuits are in the forefront. Now if you know Ignatius Loyola started the Jesuits and they take an oath and in that oath they swear in that oath that if they have to lie, if they have to deceive, whatever they have to do to get the job done, they'll do it just like a Muslim. And in the Quran is taught that he can lie to you if he needs to to defend his position, get whatever he wants to get done for strategic purposes, that he can do it. So just keep that in mind, that these Jesuits are taking over the Vatican, that there has been a big, there has been an immense fight going on inside the Vatican, and obviously they took over, because who's your pope? He's a Jesuit. So who won the battle? One man... Malachi Martin, who tried to reveal this stuff to the world and talk about this and try to make people understand what's going on in the Vatican, wound up dying under suspicious circumstances. He told a priest right before he died, he said, somebody jerked the rug out from under my feet. I fell down the stairs, went into a coma. They put me in the hospital. I came back out of that coma for just a little while, and I'm telling you that somebody murdered me. And Malachi Martin was about to write a book that was going to reveal all this stuff about what's going on inside the Vatican. Another priest in the Catholic Church was, uh, uh, was saying this. I think he appeared on Italian, uh, Italian television and was telling the world about what's going on inside the Vatican, and they found him with his throat cut. These people apparently had come out with too much too soon and the Vatican had made a decision or whoever's running this thing that this was too soon to get this information out and the time when the time is right that it will come out. So the, uh, uh, when you find people that are dying of suspicious circumstances that have something to say about somebody, a police detective would say to you, hold on, <laughs> there's something going on here, right? Exactly. And this is what happened. Uh, another man, another priest died uh, because he had, uh, he was, he was uh, along with Malachi Martin, this other priest, he was trying to warn the people. He's trying to tell the world. He was trying to say, look, there's something going on inside the Vatican that is sinister, that is very sinister, and that these people intend to, uh, to take over the Vatican. And when they do take it over, they're going to lead the world's religions and the world into a one world government. Do you remember reading the book of Revelation where it talks about the beast turning against the whore and devouring her? Do you remember that? It talks about that. I think it's chapter 17. When the beast is the Antichrist, turns against the whore, which is the religious harlot, that gathers the souls of all mankind together and points them to the Antichrist, he turns against her and destroys her. Well, there is an alliance, folks, that's taking place right now, religious and political. The political alliance has to do with NASA. It has to do with these space aliens. It has to do with people like this woman scientist. She's a scientist, folks. She says there is no doubt that extraterrestrials are up there and they're coming down here and we're going to see them soon and it's going to happen. Wouldn't you imagine what the world would think 
If all of a sudden Pope Francis appeared on TV with one standing next to him or something of that nature and said, they're here, here they are, let me tell you who they are, let me tell you what's happening, let me tell you what's going on, the world would be shocked to death to see something like that. Shocked to death. Especially a church that is 35 miles long and a quarter of an inch deep. Right? Next time I say it, it's going to be an eighth inch deep. <laughs> it's, getting it's getting more shallow by the day. <laughs> Can you imagine? Can you imagine? What do you think it would be? In 2009, the Vatican, here's what they did. In 2009, the Vatican called for an astrobiology study. All right. In other words, a star biology study. They called Vatican scientists, uh, astronomers from around the world, professors of theology, theoretical physicist. Stephen Hawking is a theoretical physicist, like at CERN, Switzerland. They started discussing, and here was the discussion from this Vatican meeting in 2009. What would the effect on faith and religion be given the discovery of advanced extraterrestrial intelligence in the universe? What would the effect be? What if you awaken one day to the President of the United States and the Presidents of the other countries standing with a Pope and make an announcement, we are in contact with extraterrestrials or they are here, whatever the scenario may be. What would the effect be on the world? What would it be? It would be profound. It would be astounding. There's no way that we could tell what that effect would be. Now, he that let it will let till it be taken out of the way. People are seeing things right now that literally scare people to death. I believe from what I've observed, what little bit of study I've done in this, that the removing of the hand that's holding it back is not just one time, just click, all of a sudden the door opens, but it's gradual. The reason I believe that is because the Lord said in Matthew 24 that men's hearts would fail them for fear, seeing those things that are coming on the earth. They begin, in other words, a gradual removing of this hindering spirit, whatever it is. A lot of folks say it's the Holy Ghost. That's, you know, that's a different study altogether. But something is holding it back. There's no doubt about that. Something, God is, but how, how are you doing? It's his business. But God is holding back the force of hell right now before he turns it loose. And when he turns it loose, Revelation chapter number 9, what does it talk about in 9? Revelation 9. There's two doors open in the book of Revelation. Exactly. Uh, Revelation chapter number 4 and 5, I saw heaven open. He's carried up into a door, into heaven. John is. Revelation 9, an angel with a, with a chain comes, key rather, comes down to the bottomless pit and opens it up. And up from the pit and comes Apollyon and Abaddon. And uh, their names mean destruction. Apollos was an old Greek god of destruction. As a matter of fact, this is the thing I picked up this past week. CERN, Switzerland, is built on the site of an ancient Greek temple to Apollos. That's remarkable. And Apollos was the god of destruction. Isn't it amazing how this stuff begins to connect? And that the people that live around there, of course, are seeing all kinds of stuff. All kinds of stuff are being seen. I've got some ideas about, about this thing about seeing. I believe it has more to do with your spiritual state than it does with the actual revelation of what's going on there. In other words, two people could be standing in the same place, one sees something and the other one not. See what I mean? Because of your spiritual state, your spiritual condition. But that's another thing entirely. So it's remarkable that CERN, Switzerland is built on the spot of an ancient uh, 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 temple the altar to Apollos. When the Lord Jesus Christ stood at Caesarea Philippi, I've been there. There's a, there's a wall, a mountain right there. And I walked up to the alcove 
There's an alcove right there that's cut right into the stone. I looked right at that image of Pan, where Pan had been right there in that, in that alcove. You're looking at something thousands of years old. The water comes up out of the mountain there at Benias. That's what it's called, Benias. It's the headwaters of the Jordan River. And the Jordan flows on down all the way into the Dead Sea. The Lord Jesus Christ stood there and said, Upon this rock I will build my church. In Matthew chapter 16 at, at Caesarea Philippi. He said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And he was probably looking right into the mouth of that mountain because they say that is one of the gates of hell. There's more than one, but that was one of them right there, the gates of hell. 1 Corinthians 2, 1. The Apostle Paul addresses the church at Corinth, and here's what he says. I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And Father, I pray now that you bless the going forth of your word, the seed that is sown, Father. And I know it will not return void, but it will accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing where you sent it. In thy holy name, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. The scripture says, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. The scripture says, give not that which is holy to the dogs, cast not your pearls before swine. The scripture says, if you can receive it, receive it, otherwise you can't receive it. It's for who it is for. The word of God is a powerful thing. This is why it's hated so much. This is why the Muslim world despises the cross. They despise it. And you can see their videos where they're training to kill crusaders. That's what they call us. They'll have a cross erected inside of a building or something where they're shooting into that cross. They despise it. And uh, the Apostle Paul says, I came knowing nothing among you but Christ and Him crucified. If you take the cross out of Christianity, then you've gutted it. There's nothing left. The cross is the centerpiece. It's the uh, answer for man's sin. It's the focal point of the grace of God. It's the calling point for all sinners. It's the rallying cry for all who believe. The cross. I'm going to preach the cross. Know nothing among you but Christ and Him crucified. I'm going to try tonight to give you just a little bit about how to discern spirits. And I think it's important today because they're, 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 turn loose on us, folks. You, you're living in a... Uh, this, this, is, this has never been before, an age like this. Pandora's box has been opened. Every kind of spirit in the world is out there and in the church house. And we need, to, we need to know how to discern spirits. It's important. For example, here in the First Corinthians, the Apostle Paul addressed the church. Some said, I'm of Paul, some of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, and so forth. These were people who were uh, sectarian. And they were sectarian. There's a little group over here that were followers of Paul, a little group over here followers of, of Cephas, Peter, some even followers of Christ. And so that meant that they had gathered among themselves to their own little groups. And the Apostle Paul rebuked them for that. That's not the Holy Spirit. There's only one Lord, one faith, one baptism, just one. And he rebuked them for that. Then there were those who questioned his authority. They said, now who are you anyway? Who, who gave you authority to preach over us? And he said, some of you have questioned my authority. Then he said to them, truly the signs of an apostle were wrought by me. And uh, that's very true because he was one chosen out of due season. But here again, the church at Corinth had a problem with the authority of the apostle Paul, who wrote the biggest majority of the New Testament. But they had a, they had a, they had a, they had a problem with authority. Now that's apostolic authority, folks. Make no mistake about this. There are no apostles today. Any man who would arrogate to himself the title of apostles got a problem. Say, so why is that? Apostles could write scripture. Apostles could raise the dead. Apostles had power that was altogether different from anyone else around them. Now, you might say, well, I have, I have the apostolic gifts in the sense that I have the gifts of the Spirit. And they enumerated there's nine of them. Well, that's just like any other Christian. These gifts are available for all Christians. It's not so much the gift that you possess, it's the giver that gives it. Amen. See, the issue is, is, is focused on the wrong place. 
It's not the gift. You don't go around boasting about a gift, bragging about some gift you have. The boasting is in the Lord. We can't do anything without Him. John chapter number 15. So without me, you, can do any, you can't do anything. But they had a problem with that. They also had a problem with super spiritual Christians. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Some said, I have no need of thee. I have no need of thee. And the reason they said that is because some, he said, were the hands, some were the eyes, some were the foot, and so forth. They made up the body of Christ. And some said, my goodness gracious, I'm far above you. I don't have any need of you. But my dear friend, I don't care how high you sail, you need a foundation. <laughs> there better be something under you holding you up. <laughs> and uh, so uh, we need each other. The Bible says that he placed in the church what was necessary, and he gave more honor to some than he did others. The church is built, the Lord Jesus builds it, not us. It's not my place to determine who goes where and who belongs here and who belongs there. Good night. What man needs that kind of responsibility? He doesn't have that ability anyway. Just leave that to God. That's right. Let him do the building. And he said you're a building fitly framed together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. When God walks into the midst of this place, he doesn't see you. He sees the deity of Christ. You're covered by gold. Remember, the walls of that temple were wooden walls that represented humanity, but it was covered by gold. Yeah, that's a, it's quite a study in itself, you know. When I was preaching about the glory of God, I told you how on one side it was darkness, the other side it's light. God does these things like that, where on one side it's wood, but on the other side it's gold. He doesn't come in here checking out our humanity. That's not going to impress God a bit. The Bible says the flesh cannot please God. He's looking for deity. And I want deity covering me, don't you? Amen. This is why the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians, He has made unto us righteousness, and sanctification, redemption, and all these things. As I've told you before, there's a different type of righteousness that is developed in the New Testament that is completely separate from the Old Testament. God Himself is righteous, always has been, always will be. We're talking about the Father. But when God was manifest in flesh 2,000 years ago, the God-man was born, and that man lived a sinless, perfect life. That sinless, perfect life was a life of righteousness, and he ascended to heaven by his own righteousness, and he, uh, he entered into the presence of God by his own righteousness. Nothing like that had ever happened before. Nothing. <laughs> no one could ever dare enter into the presence of God by his own righteousness, but Christ did. And he entered in because he was righteous, sinless, holy, pure, and perfect. Sat down at the right hand of the Father. Now that righteousness is what becomes my righteousness. Amen. And so it's the righteousness of the saints. The church at Corinth had all kinds of problems. They had a problem with tongues in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. They were trying to out-talk each other apparently. They had all kinds of confusion going on inside the building. And, uh, and the apostle Paul rebuked them over it. He said, if somebody walks into your midst, they think you're crazy. He said, he said, one's prophesying, one's speaking in tongues, one's doing this, one's doing that. He said, it's a madhouse, to paraphrase him, of course. <laughs> aren't, these aren't exactly the words that he used. But he rebuked them over it. Here was the simple rebuke to all of it. If, here's, what, here's the point. If this is really of the Holy Ghost, you don't need to be rebuked. For God is a God of order. God is not the God of confusion. Amen. Satan is the author of confusion. Not God. So that's a, that's, a, that's a way of saying you need to check, double check what you are doing and what's going on in your midst. The church at Corinth, as you know, in 1 Corinthians 5, it allowed a man who had his father's wife to be, uh, to be part of the system, the church, be part of what's going on. They didn't, uh, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't, uh, they allowed him to be part of the fellowship. You know, and I've tried to explain this to you before so many times. There's no telling what's liable to walk through that back door. Somebody comes in here smelling of the world. They look like the world. They talk like the world. They act like the world. We're going to run them off. We're going to preach to them. I mean, folks, think about it this way. I've heard preachers get up and say, well, bless God, you know, they come in and don't have any respect for the house of God. Who are you talking about? What kind of garbage is that? You take a man or a woman that doesn't know the Lord, they don't know anything. But you say that soul right there is hungry and they're seeking for something. They know they need help. And they come into the church house and they come in there and they sit down and they start listening to the Word of God. Why, it's, oh, well, I welcome them. 
It may be two men holding hands. So what are you going to do about that? Well, tell them to turn loose of each other. <laughs> but they can still stay. Right? You say, preacher, that wouldn't happen. It's already happened. It's already happened right here. <laughs> so if you're living in a little bubble isolated from the world today, you don't have a clue what's going on. Oh, no. Listen, here's the point. If they can't come in here and get the truth, where will they go? Will they go to Knox County Commission, sit on the board over there while they're meeting about government business? Are they going to go over to UT and, and, and listen to the professor? Where are they going to go? They're going to go to the lighthouse. They're going to go to the salt of the earth. They're going to go to the place where they can get something for their soul. And hopefully, when they walk out the door, the two of them come in holding hands and walk out the door. One will walk out that side, and the other one will walk out that side, and they'll be born again. And they'll say to each other out in the foyer, see you later, alligator. <laughs> it's over. <laughs> You say, what do you mean by that? If you ever get saved, your partner and you will split. It's that simple. It's that simple. Once you're born again, the Holy Ghost will come in and make all the difference in the world. The church at Corinth had a problem with people who, uh, who had turned the Lord's Supper into a feast. And some were bringing more food than others and all kinds of stuff was going on and and that, that, that increased the tension among the people. A lot of tension at the church at Corinth. A lot of tension. And it created problems because some people came in there and they brought a feast. They just, you know, it, 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 instead of the Lord's Supper being the Lord's Supper, a time of solemnity, a time of introspection, retrospection, a time of, 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 of real spiritual uh, discernment, they turned it into a, into a, into a feast, uh, into, a, into a drunken brawl, if you please. And the, and the Apostle Paul said, for this reason, you've buried some of your good buddies. They're dead. They sleep. They're gone. God killed them. Now, that's not too popular today when you start preaching like that in the churches. They think, good night. Who told me? You tell me God's going to kill you? Oh, yeah, he can do it. The devil can kill you. Don't you think God can? <laughs> the devil can do away with you in a heartbeat. But if you belong to the Lord, he can't. Amen. So the church at Corinth had all kinds of problems, all kinds of problems. So what is the point in the message tonight then? I was recently excoriated. I get excoriated all the time through emails. I have to prepare myself when I start reading them, you know, because you never know what you're liable to hear. <laughs> to some folks, I'm the greatest thing in the world. To some, I'm the worst devil that ever lived. <laughs> so somewhere in between, I guess I'll find the true me. <laughs> <laughs> That's just part of it. How do you know you've got the Holy Ghost in you? You don't smoke. You don't chew. You don't run with this crowd. You don't, you don't do all the stuff that, that the world does. You know, I mean, I mean you're, you're, your morality is clean. I mean, you, you're an exemplary citizen. How do you know you've got the Holy Ghost in you? That's the issue. All right. Now, for everything that has, everything usually that is anything of value, there's a test for it, right? Now, I don't know how a jeweler tests to determine if something is 24 karat gold, but I'm, I'm, I think a jeweler can tell you. He's in the business, and you walk in there with a diamond. He can look at that diamond. And he can pretty well tell you if that diamond's is clean and pure and the right color and all that. You know, no no cracks in it. His livelihood depends on it. How do you know when it's really the Holy Ghost or you're not just emotionally attached to something? You get all fired up over something. You've had an emotional experience. In the Old Testament, when they walked in, God said to Ezekiel, go dig in the walls. He dug in the wall. What did he find? He found women weeping for Tammuz. He had the leaders of Israel worshiping the sun. He found all kind of apostasy, all kinds of it. They were very emotionally involved in what they were doing. So number one, warning, don't let your emotions rule your faith in Christ. They can mess you up because you can be stirred emotionally. Let me tell you something about emotions. Emotions can be affected by your soul. Your soul can be affected by your flesh. 
Because your soul is either affected by your flesh or by your spirit. It depends which one you're feeding the most. If you're feeding your spirit, your soul will be guided by your spirit. But if you're feeding your flesh, your soul will be guided by your flesh. You'll, have a, you'll be a fleshly type, carnal type Christian that the Bible talks about. So emotions won't do the job. Well, preacher, I got my list right here. I believe all the things. I'm, I'm glad you got your list. You know, I've never seen anybody that could take their list and compare it with somebody else's list and they were exactly the same. What do you do when you get in a situation like that? He's got his list and he's got his list and both of them swear by their list, but his list doesn't agree with his list. What do you do? He's got all his do's and don'ts. He's got his do's and don'ts and they compare them. Come to find out the folks that live in this certain area of the country, their do's and don'ts are kind of like this, but when they live over in here, their do's and don'ts are kind of like that. And the do's and the don'ts, they change according to the culture, the time, the place, the geography, and all of that. Is that what's going to tell you you've got the Holy Ghost? There's a test. And this is so important. A man excoriated me just recently. I read it today. And he told me all about his experience. And he was so happy in his experience. He was so blessed in his experience. He wanted me to know that I needed the experience that he had. He, he let me understand that I was nowhere near as spiritual as he was because of the experience that he had enjoyed and was enjoying. He wanted me to have that experience. He didn't concern himself one bit with where I came from, what I was before God saved me, and how he changed me. He was simply all about his experience. After I read that, I thought to myself, you know, there's something missing in here. There's something missing. I'd gone through that whole list, all this stuff, and I said, there's something missing in here. There's something missing. Something missing. How do you test the spirits? How do you test them? I adjure thee by Jesus, whom Paul preaches, to come out of him. You know who said that? These were professional exorcists. I adjure thee by Jesus, whom Paul preaches. There's a clue. I adjure thee by Jesus, whom Paul preaches. Come out of him. Is there power in the name of Jesus? So how do you know? Well, I'm going to tell you how you'll know the Holy Ghost is in you. And this is the acid test. How's that, preacher? Your life is about Jesus. It's about the Son of God. You love Him. You think about Him all day long. You pray to Him. You tell Him how thankful you are He's your Savior. He's wonderful. He's the fairest of 10,000 to your soul. He's the rose of Sharon, the bright morning star. You get up in the morning and the first thing on your mind is Jesus. You wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning and you start talking to him in the dark. Oh, I do that all the time. My schedule is altogether different from everybody else's, most people anyway. 2 o'clock in the morning, I'll be talking to the Lord. 3 o'clock in the morning. And I tell him how wonderful he is and how gracious and good he is to call me out of hell and save my soul. It's about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's always been about Jesus. It'll always be about Jesus. It's not about your experience. Your experience can get messed up and you can start comparing your experience with somebody else. And you can think, my goodness, I've heard that testimony. I didn't have all that happen to me. I didn't hear any angels. I didn't see. I didn't hear any music. Didn't see any stars. Good night. Maybe I'm not saved. Or somebody said, well, now, you know, you're, you don't belong to our church. You need to belong to our church. Let me tell you about our church. I don't hear about your church. I, I don't want to be mean, but let me tell you something. I don't care about your church. I care about Jesus. Well, you need to hear my preacher. My preacher's the finest preacher on earth. I don't care who your preacher is. My preacher's the greatest preacher. My preacher's the preacher. I don't care anything about your preacher. Well, our movement or our history, I don't care anything about that. If you want to know that the Holy Ghost is really dwelling in you, 
The Bible tells you plainly in John chapter number 16, when he is coming to this world, he will not speak of himself, but he will speak of me. He will convince the world of sin because they believe if the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit of God is working in your soul, the Lord Jesus Christ becomes your everything. Yes, he does. And he can be far, and, and that's just not to belittle Savior. Savior, that's first. You don't have that, forget the rest. But he's not only your Savior, he's your buckler. He's your high tower. He's your escape. He's your fortified city. He's that city of refuge. He's the darling of your soul. He's, he's, he's the bright and morning star. He's the answer to every question you've got. All of your problems can be solved in Jesus. It's all about Him. It's about who He is. And it's about what He is to you. It's what He is in you. It's about Him. It's all about Him, folks. It's all about Him. You're lost. So you can have an experience. And you can talk about your experience like it's the greatest thing in the world. And everybody needs your experience. But I didn't get anything in that thing about Jesus. That's what I'm telling you. I read that, and I looked at it, and I thought to myself, now hold on. Where's Jesus? <laughs> Where is the Son of God in all of this? Are you following me? Yes. Got to be awful careful, folks. Satan can lay a spiritual trap for you and make you think that you are so much better than most of the Christians around you. And it's just not so. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's everything. The Apostle Paul says, for to me to live. Now watch the wording. For to me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. I fell in love with him in 1973. I came out of hell. I had the stench of hell all over me. My soul was darkened and dead like you wouldn't believe. I had a past that the Lord knows, thank God that he can forgive you for. But I've never come out of it. I would have never known him. I would have never known a thing about him had not a light begun to shine in my soul. He drew me by his grace. God brought me out from where I was and changed me completely. All it took was one simple prayer. Bow my head and say, God, be merciful to me a sinner and forgive me. And when I raised my head back up, I was in another world. I had completely changed. I had no idea at the time how profound the change was going to be. I didn't. I had no idea. I had no idea of how deep the spiritual world was I was about to step into. I had no idea. And the last thing on my mind was that one day he'd call me to preach. That wasn't even a consideration. It wasn't a consideration. I just knew that I was a guilty, hell-bound sinner and God had just saved me. And I couldn't wait to tell somebody. I couldn't wait. I couldn't wait. And I had went out and I started telling people about Jesus. <laughs> I said, let me tell you what Jesus has just done for me. Let me tell you about Jesus. And you know what? I'd go around to the church people that I went to church with. And I'd say that to them. And some of them said, well, that's good. I'm glad to hear that. Now, that's, that's wonderful. Some of them would just kind of brush it off. And, you know, I ran into everything in the world in that church. Everything. But I'm not being critical of the church. It's just like most churches. You've got tares among the wheat. But I know one thing. I know I've learned some things about God since 1973. And I've learned he chastens his own. I've learned it. And you know what the old timers used to say about that? They say, you ought to shout. Because that's his mark on you that you're his son. <laughs> and I do shout. <laughs> I do shout. I do shout.
He said, note, the Vatican operates a binocular telescope much like this new one just described here, also known as the Large Binocular Telescope. The Large Binocular Telescope and the similar but smaller version described in this paper leads one to conclude that if the smaller telescope recently is detecting these entities, then so must the larger only for a much longer time frame, perhaps several years now. Detection of and the revealing of such entities leads to one very important conclusion. Disclosure, the grand deception. Do not allow yourself to be deceived. Yes, they may in fact be detecting entities. The deception is the coming announcement from the Pope that mankind is now in contact with quote, our benevolent ancestors from the stars. There will be two types of entities announced by the Pope, just as pointed out in this paper, the good guys and the bad, and things are about to get ugly. The entities labeled good or bad according to the Vatican are demonic entities. Simple. Please note this once again, American Journal of Modern Physics, special issue, issue two, Foundations of Hadronic Mechanics. Notice the word hadronic, same as the large Hadron Collider of CERN. These telescopes and the Large Hadron Collider are in collusion. The Large Hadron Collider will open a large interdimensional portal, turning the key to the abyss, releasing vast quantities of these entities into our plane of existence. Adding to this Project Bluebeam, holographic projections upon our atmosphere of alien craft. More to come. Don't be fooled. And you can check out more of Anthony Patch's work at anthonypatch.com. There are several videos and interviews that I've done with him that I'll link to as well. But this is kind of a big deal, guys. I mean, if there's any significance to this research done by Santilli, then we're talking about actual verifiable evidence that there are entities unseen in our skies and all around us. And it reminds me of Isaiah 14, 9, where it says, Sheol beneath is stirred up to meet you when you come. It rouses the shades to greet you, all who were leaders of the earth. It raises from their thrones all who were kings of the nations. And why is this significant? Well, you have Sheol, but then you have the mention of the rising of the spirits of the dead. In the King James, it stirreth up the dead for thee. The ESV, it rouses the shades to greet you. But if we dig into the Hebrew here, the spirit of the dead is the word Rephaim. And the Bible often talks about the land of the Rephaim or the valley of the Rephaim. And there's a definite connection between the Rephaim and the Nephilim. And you can find that in Deuteronomy 2, verse 10, 11, also verse 20 and 21, where it talks about the Rephites who were like the Anakim, the giants. And who were the Anakim? They are the descendants of the Nephilim, Numbers 13, 33. So there's a huge tie in there. And the fact that Isaiah 14 talks about this realm of the dead being stirred up and having in concert with it the rise of the kings of the earth of the nations this all looks like it plays into the beast system in the end times described in revelation 13.